Joining us now for more on this, Julia Coronado, former FOMC economist. She is the founder and president of Macro Policy Perspectives. Uh, welcome. So your reaction, first of all, Julia, to these numbers? Yeah, I'm going to go with Steve's a little bit more optimistic take. We got a surge in productivity, and this is something that we thought would be a, a, a theme this year. Um, yes, we have higher rates from the Fed. Yes, we have a slowing economy. But meanwhile, we have this offset from better functioning. The economy's functioning better, less supply chain frictions, much lower labor turnover. All of that spells a productivity dividend for companies. Uh, and that's the secret sauce of non-inflationary growth. So at least for the near term, I think we're set for a pretty positive performance in the U.S. economy as, as we just operate better and more efficiently. And that is less inflationary and that it allows the Fed to not keep ratcheting higher. Uh, and, and, you know, we can, we can have that, you know, the, the possibility of a soft landing looks more tangible than it did six months ago. Right. Okay. So for people who are looking at the numbers right now and maybe at the economy in general, th this Fitch rating downgrade on the U.S. long term, uh, it doesn't matter. I, I guess you agree. Um, but from the broader perspective, at what point does this load of debt start to matter? Yeah, it's a great question. And the unfortunate answer is it doesn't have to do with numbers like debt to GDP. You can look at Japan, their, they, their numbers are much higher. But then you can look at countries, emerging market countries, who have much lower debt to GDP and much more inflation and, and uh, currency problems. So it really has, there's no specific number that we can point to and say, aha, that's where the problem lies. It's more about trust and confidence in the economy, in the institutions that manage money, the Fed, the Treasury, the U.S. government. That was something that Fitch cited, poor governance, uh, our sort of dancing around the debt ceiling problem as one reason for the downgrade. And I'm, I'm very sympathetic to that uh, as a risk. We just hmm. don't know when that accumulates into you know, an erosion of confidence in the dollar. And as Rick pointed out, What's the alternative? Well, you know, I don't feel better when you say, Julia, when you say Japan, I don't feel better, though. I mean, is that is that our well, future? I mean, Japan has a very high debt to GDP, uh, but they've grown in term, in per capita terms. They have very high standards of living and, you know, not fantastic, but OK productivity growth. Uh, you know, it's not the worst case scenario. I think when we talk about high yeah. debt to GDP, we think of inflation. Julia, isn't, isn't part of it, and, though? Isn't part of it de debt to GDP as, as just compared to ourselves? I mean, by the year 2029, the CBO says that we're going to be at debt to DG GDP levels that are higher than we were during World War II. I think it's about trajectories and right. just comparing the United States to itself over time. No, no, I, I, I hear you. And, and it is a risk. I, I certainly would not downplay that um, taking on ever increasing amounts of debt doesn't pose some risk to the stability of the dollar, to the trust in the U.S. dollar, uh, and therefore the fiscal trade-offs and inflationary pressures. It absolutely does. All I'm saying is there's not one magic number. Debt to GDP isn't the number that's going to tell us that. It's a broader story about the functioning of our economy, the productivity of our economy, the stability of our governance and our institutions. That's what I worry about.